Hey, everybody, this is Kate. And Devin. Welcome to Med Crimes. Happy New Year. Oh, my freaking word. Do we want to test? Okay. Hi. Welcome back, everyone. <laughs> We're sorry for the prolonged break. Yeah, that was sucky. We've really been trying. We really have. We Let's actually, so we got together. Holidays. <clears throat> my children got sick. Yep. You got New Year's. Yep. We tried to get together. Uh-huh. Computer crashed. Uh-huh. Mid-recording. <laughs> Purchased new computer. Thank you, Patreons. Thank you. <sighs> What a nightmare it's been. And and then there was a sickness in my house. Yeah. So it's just one of those things, you know, you try. And then sometimes you just get together at 6.31 p.m. on a fucking Tuesday. Tuesday on a Tuesday. In your scrubs after work like a Neanderthal. <laughs> just because we're like, we got to do this. We got to do this. Our Weeks. listeners are waiting, dude. So, so here we are. We're back. Couple things. Oh, my God. There's been so much stuff that's happened so r.i.p betty white <sighs> r.i.p bob saget r.i.p bob saget danny tanner danny tanner and then something a lot well i won't say a lot more serious because betty white and bob saget were serious but yeah but this is this is ongoing oh. and we don't know we don't really know the outcome and it's very upsetting um, because it's literally in our own backyard yeah, here yeah. in New England. So for those of you who are not in New England, not in the United States either, um, there's a news story going around in our state right now about a missing child. And what's what's striking about this, other than a missing child, which is striking, is that no one has seen this girl for two years. And it's literally just getting investigated now. Now. Her name is Harmony Montgomery, and she's from Manchester, New Hampshire. This this little girl, if you see, we can post pictures and we'll post some oh, information. Yeah, you look absolutely. at her picture, and I mean, she is just the most beautiful, gorgeous little angel with this oh, cute little so glasses. Sweet. And just if you read about her story, it's like this girl never had a chance. And it comes out when all of a sudden, you know, DCYF can't find her that no one's actually physically laid eyes on the girl since 2019. It's insane. It's and insane. meanwhile, she's, she's she's supposed to be seven right now. Yes. So she's a missing seven year old girl. Yes. No one has seen her since she's been since she was five. Right. Um, they're estimating that she's about 40 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess, you know, who knows? Nobody's seen her. Um, but. There's been charges brought up on the dad and the, her stepmother. Yes. None of which are actual, like, there, there's no there's no kidnapping, there's no murder. Like, none of that, those charges yet, they're kind of like outstanding charges. One right. of them's a welfare fraud on the exactly. behalf of Harmony. Because not sketchy at all, the mom, or the stepmom, I'm sorry, not the mom, the yes, stepmom the step has been collecting welfare on behalf of this missing child, despite the fact that she's not been physically there since so 2019 it and spending that money that's nice while not taking care of harmony yep so if anyone out there um so there is a current reward uh for any information that's going to help find her that's up to a hundred thousand dollars but even if the reward was only a dollar i mean come on this oh god is, it doesn't this matter is, forget it yeah so the right thing to do is to help find her or give any information if anybody knows anything exactly um, there's a tip line that you can call 603-203-6060 um, if you have any information on anything to help find this poor girl. We're all very upset by this and we're we're staying tuned. And it's and, and it's in our backyard. It's literally in our backyard. We're seeing stories in People magazine, CBS, like yeah. or sorry, CNN rather, not yeah, yeah. CBS, whatever. Well. But we're seeing stories everywhere, and this is literally happening an hour away. Yeah. So we just are, like, her whole, you know, she is totally in our thoughts. Let's all just help bring this little angel home, no matter how she is or who she's with or, or what's going on. Absolutely. Um, and we're all just holding out hope. We're thinking of her. Yep. 
Um, I hope she's safe. Oh God, me too. I think we're all I hope she's really safe. hoping this little girl will post about her as well and some links to some of her articles. So um, on another note, we have a Patreon shout out. Yay! Woo! Sharon Clark from Australia. Sharon. We down love the you. You are awesome. Sharon, and I think you I don't I, I just interrupted you. That's it's you do that all the Sharon, time. I think we all know this. You are our first Patreon that's not from friends or family word of mouth. I know. Like, You're you like our, our first, first official. Fan Patreon official. I'm sorry you had to wait so long for your shout out that it's taken <laughs> weeks for us to get there. But we're here. Thank you for your support. Thank you for listening to yes. us. Um, and we just we, we just really love the support. Thank you so much. You're literally the best. Thank you so much. You're all the best. We love all of our Patreons, honestly. We we couldn't do any of this without you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. You. All, all four of you. Thank you, Devin. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> we love hey, you guys. These are the early days. These right? are. These are the these good are days. The, early the good old days. days. The early days. we'll be like listing off a dozen Patreons. Oh, hell yeah. Time, right? Yep. Exactly. Because That's what we're hoping for. But I, we have to say these things so that people are like, oh my oh, God, we have remember to. when? Yeah, yeah. Remember when we had Sharon, our mm-hmm. first Patreon back in the mm-hmm. day? Our exactly. First stranger Patreon. Yeah. She's okay. not a stranger. She's she's our best friend she's now. She's a friend. She's a friend. Also, if any of you out there are interested in becoming a Patreon, yeah. Patreon number five, that slot's still open. <laughs> www.patreon.com slash medcrimes podcast. It's a good slot. Get it while it lasts. Five's a good round number. I'd want to be number it's five. It's not a round number. It's not an even number at all. <laughs> I said I I I I know that. I, I do know that, Devin, but I'm saying it's a good... Re- I, it's an expression... I don't... Never mind. <laughs> Moving on. It's been a long day. Um, okay, so today's case is really interesting. It's also really, really heavy. Like, really heavy. We're um, going to be talking about this guy named Yosef Mengele, and I apologize in advance because I did find several different pronunciations of his name i've seen mengali and mengeli but i'm gonna go with mengele because that's the one that i've found most often now uh he was a nazi physician he was the most prominent of a group of nazi physicians who conducted inhumane experiments that often caused harm and death to concentration camp prisoners mm. so big Do trick we, warning we, here we, we read my mind yes girl so big trigger warning here holocaust themes we're going to be talking about children like really creepy really graphic medical experiments like mass murder all of it i think i'm also going to say that my own personal trigger warning if you're someone who believes that the holocaust didn't happen oh yeah we don't want you here you can go away sign off you can find another podcast we don't want you here bye yeah, that really that really uh, is very upsetting that mm-hmm. there's still people in the I world that don't think that, that happened. I can't believe there's still people out there. I, it, I, just, oh, I hope are. you stub you to- your toe every fucking day. You wake up and you stub your toe really, really hard. And it goes deeper and deeper and deeper into your soul. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, let's start with Dr. Joe... Uh, sorry. Sorry. Yosef Mengele. So... He was born March 16th, 1911 in Gunsberg, which is a village outside of Ulm in Germany. He was the oldest of three brothers. Now, by all accounts, his childhood was actually normal and happy. They didn't move around a lot. The family That's was very close. years ago. It took you a little while to do that <laughs> equation. And people don't really recall any reports of heavy extremism within his family, at least early on. No anti-Semitism or, you know, social behavioral concerns that might indicate a propensity to harm others. So they were normal. They were normal. By all accounts, they were normal. But the culture at this time, which we're going to get into, I think, contributed to a lot of his behaviors and ideals later on. So he was the eldest son of Carl Mengele, who was a well-to-do man, and he was in the farming equipment business. And um, he manufactured farming equipment and actually owned his own manufacturing company. And he was married to a woman named Valberga. Um, now, his mother, Valberga, was three years older than her husband. And Cougar. What? She's a cougar. Oh, okay. Cougar. I couldn't understand you. I'm sorry. <laughs> So, yeah, she was a little older than him. Um, She also came from a well-to-do family, though. So um, 
Mengele described that his father as the more gentle one and his mom was sort of the disciplinarian in the family. And they had a pretty full household because they had both parents, they had the three kids, and they had sets of grandparents that stayed with them from time to time. So there was always a lot of people around. Um, and the vibe in the house was described as conservative, Catholic, and conventional, but like normal for that time. Okay. So as a boy, he joined the Greater German Youth League. Now, this was a conservative group with multiple different chapters, and they sort of like held meetings and worked on projects. So sort of like the model of like Boy Scouts. You know, you like get together as like a youth, there's like a youth leader, and then you like work on projects and stuff. Did they have the fancy vest too? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Why don't you Google that? German? Okay, Greater German Youth League. Did they have fancy vests? I'm working on it. All right, cool. Devin's Googling. So Mengele recalls that they didn't accept Jews into this group. Oh. And they maintained sort of an order of, quote, characteristic qualities of the German people, quote, within the group. And this was sort of his first taste of, like, the extremist or separatist sort of belief and at some point in his sort of mid-childhood his dad did go off to war leaving his mom to raise the three boys would this be world war one yes i was trying to think of the timeline and during this time he did fairly well in school and he had a lot of friends he was a bit sickly for a period of time and he missed a lot of school because he had some chronic kidney ailments and um, initially, he was being groomed to sort of assume his father's company as he got older. But he developed this, like, keen interest in, like, science and anthropology. And he started really wanting to pursue going to college instead. So his school records indicate that he favored elective courses that were, like, German National Socialism and other conservative, like, philosophical sort of ventures. And... The thing that he found most exciting was human anthropology, and which is like, you know, the study of like different cultures, different races and how, you know, things get sort of passed down. And mm-hmm. um, it's all that it's all very interesting. And that was the thing that he really uh, that really motivated him to pursue science as a whole. Mm-hmm. And he had a specific interest very early on prior to even starting med school in human genetics. So. Mm. That would be interesting. Oh, yeah, it I'll is. Give him that. It gets very complicated. Oh, very complicated. I mean, you're talking about all these different genomes and mm, yeah, right down to the cells. And... Is... He <laughs> began studying philosophy during his undergraduate days in Munich. And there he became fascinated with the works and writings of a man named Alfred Rosenberg. And he was one of the founders and initial ideologists of Nazism. And Alfred wrote books and edited an idealist news publication, and he published a lot of works, uh, which included a 19th century like fabrication, essentially, concerning a supposed Jewish plot of like world domination, and as well as other works that explored all of the ideals of this German racial purity. I don't like that. I don't. Nobody likes no, that this day and age. It's like really that. gross. Mm-mm. And he ended up actually working very close with Hitler, and Hitler followed many of his works and ideals. Ew. I know. So he then pursued his medical degree at the University of Frankfurt in Germany. They have hot dogs there. I mean, I would think so. Right? Frankfurt? I, I think. I could be wrong. Now, there, he studied under a few different professors who were admirers of Hitler, and he started using his research talents to sort of shift towards more of a separatist ideology. And by the time he graduated in 1933, he was an ardent Nazi. And again, the culture around this time, there was a lot of propaganda around this, and there was a lot of propaganda that was anti-Jew and pro-Nazi. So he studied anthropology under a physician named Theodore Mollison, where he conducted studies on blood serum as a mean means of distinguishing the races, which like, I don't really understand really the purpose behind the, I mean, it's all very disgustingly racist, but um, I'm not really sure of, you know, what the takeaway from that is supposed to be, but, and also just to like get a sense of who this guy was and what he was going for. The subject of his dissertation was quote, Racial morphological examination of the anterior section of the lower jaw among four racial groups, end quote. 
in which that's very he, wordy. It is in which he linked physical characteristics of each jaw that he studied to the race that that person belonged to, wow. and he formulated a quote racial diagnosis based on like changes in the jaw. Wow. So this was all like super innovative for the time, and like I I, I do understand like the I mean, purpose behind that is an research. anthropological standpoint. Yeah. Absolutely, it's it's research, and maybe we're just kind of like wow and sensitive to it because sure. of the timeline that we're in right now. Exactly. You know? So all just, you know, kind of interesting stuff. Um, he also lobbied in his dissertation for the forceful sterilization of those who demonstrate a genetic probability of passing on a certain genetic defect. And Whoa. he got high praise for this what? at the time. Yeah, that's when things get twisted into not so anthropological and what, more what racist kind and of gross. What genetic defect was he talking about? Mostly cleft lips and cleft palates. So if you had a if you had the gene to pass on a cleft lip or a pe- cleft palate, he wanted to sterilize you. Yeah. Huh. Yep. Nice, huh? That's where it starts. Yes. So now he started using these facial measurements to diagnose Jewish ancestry in people. Diagnose Jewish ancestry, and this. How? Because you could, because there was, there's, I mean, with any race, there's certain facial characteristics, but but he started applying all those measurements and creating like this whole, you know, racist thing about like how, oh, well, your nose is like this and your eyes are like this. That means you must have Jewish ancestry. Therefore, you know, fuck you. I want to know what he says about my nose. Your nose is beautiful. It's fucking huge. It's not huge. I've never thought your nose is big. Moving on. Okay. The year is 1933, and this is the year that Hitler is appointed Chancellor of Germany. He was voted in by the Nazi Party, who has grown these past years, and the Nazis assumed power in Germany around this time. Now, at this time, Jews and other races were being murdered by the hundreds of thousands in the street. This is prior to concentration camps even being operational. So this is prior to the hundreds of thousands that have died then. Yeah. They're they're just... These people are literally by Nazis getting mowed down in the the middle of the street. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, this is, you know, the biggest shit stain as far as I'm concerned on world history. For sure. Honestly. For sure. Like, or one of the biggest. I think the, I think probably the biggest. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, if you're talking about like, say in the last 100 years, if you wanted to pick the top 10 for world history. Oh, this is probably. Surely right up there. The fact that. There's no way it can't be. So many people knew that this was happening. Yeah. Knew that this was going on Mm -hmm. and it just fucking continued. Mm Mm-hmm. To and build to what it became. Six million people were Could you murdered. Imagine if horribly, if there was a little bit more intervening in the beginning, I, I, maybe there was no Holocaust. Yeah, then, you know exactly. Like, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. Like how you know how long ago I learned about this and how much I've learned about it in school. Like every time I read about it, it just like boils my blood that this it still even makes happened. You angry. And, I, and I feel like there's still times where I'm still learning something new. Oh yeah! Every yeah. time I read, read about like it, I'm right like, now, "You're this shitting is me." Going to be the first physician story that I hear about. The like... stuff that this guy did is absolutely just shocking. It is shocking. It's really just awful. I hope he died in a concentration camp. Oh, he didn't. Mm. No, I wish to. So at this point, the Holocaust begins, and the concentration camps were put together so that. The Nazis had a way of controlling the population of Jews and these other races that they were targeting, the the non-Aryan folks, right? And as a way to mass murder people mm-hmm. in, by more efficient numbers. It makes it easier to not have to hunt them down. Exactly. They're all right in front of you. Exactly. So anybody who was deemed non-Aryan was imprisoned and either sent to an immediate death or labored and then died eventually. Um, millions, and wasn't obviously. it the women and children automatically immediate death? Here ba- basically, some some women who were able bodied and strong were kept alive, and we'll talk right. about a little bit more about the kids that were kept alive and and mm. all of that. So, in 1934, Josef Mengele joined the Institute of Hereditary Biology and Racial Hygiene. What? Yes, the <laughs> Institute of Hereditary Biology and Racial Hygiene. There was an institute for hereditary biology and racial hygiene. You could go to school for that shit. Oh, yeah. 
Now he was part I of their research think staff. Open today, right? They're no, closed. no, yeah, I that's... I should really yeah. fucking hope they're yeah. <laughs> long ass closed. <laughs> So they they were part of their research staff. So he was part of the research staff. So by this time, he was very much into anthropology research. Again, doing a lot of like, you know, facial symmetry stuff, jaw studies. And he was operating on the belief, as many others were during this day, that races other than the Aryan race were of different values and served only to weaken the superior Aryan race. And not only Jews were targeted, but the handicapped, the homosexual, black, um, Romani people. And for Nazis, the war offered the possibility of not only removing threats to the German race, but also taking, quote, positive steps to preserve and cultivate the German racial community. So, I mean... I'm trying to process everything. I, it's, it's really... This was literally just, like, how, you know, people just like felt and thought back then and that it was okay this was not that long ago you guys no we're less than 100 years. less than 100 years ago I mean, this we're happened talking the 30s and 40s yeah this was not that long ago it's very alarming <clears throat> so he spent limited time in pediatrics as well and he had some experience there at this institute with multiples like twins triplets and genetic medicine and this like fueled his fascination he did a lot of research in the genetics of these patients and tried to formulate patterns with twins and triplets and how they occurred Mm -hmm. and their similarities and whatnot that is what that is understandable Mm -hmm. now in 1936 still that stuff is still intriguing of course it is yeah and there's been a lot of gains since then but back then not not a whole lot was known about the genetics there so in 1936, Mengele met, met, I'm sorry, met Irena Schonbein. And now she was a 19-year-old woman and the daughter of a wealthy businessman in Freiburg, Germany. And they married in 1939. Here is the, the irony of that situation. So they were very much into like pedigree and purity back then right like your lineage had to be very pure yeah, now pure. he was associated with the nazi party yeah. and they you know when the nazi party sort of blesses or gives permission for one of their people to marry someone mm-hmm. they do extensive vetting of that person oh. they do interviews they do research into like their lineage and the background and Some all of that crazy. so i know isn't it isn't it yeah, crazy that shit crazy no, not just asking. Your they dad do for physical. Permission. No, they do physical exams. They they did all of this to try to figure out her racial purity, but they were not able to verify that she was racially pure or like a pure Aryan and shouldn't have any Jewish ancestry whatsoever. So they couldn't verify it, but they right. could not also prove that she right, was. Right, exactly. So they couldn't did... verify it a hundred percent, but they also couldn't prove that she was. So what they ended up doing was they allowed Yosef to marry her and they did get married in 1939. But should they have any children, the Nazi party would not issue them a certificate of racial purity for their children, which was a thing back then. Stop it. I swear. Like you get a birth certificate, but also. And here's also their, their like a pure racial, bread dog. It literally like That's AKC like registration. Oh. Isn't that ridiculous? So. The irony in that is that he would never have racially pure children as recognized by the Nazi party. Wow. So in 1937, though. Did they have children? They did have one son. Okay. Yes. So, and then just before they got married um, in 1937, Mengele officially joins the Nazi party, right? So as of 1939, when they got married is when he was a part of the Nazi party. Mm -hmm. Um, In 1938, he started receiving his military training and he completed his physician military training when he was stationed in Kassel. Kassel? Castle? I think Kassel. Um, And then soon after that, he he applied to join the Waffen SS, which is SS as, I guess, like a special unit of soldiers within the Nazi party. And he was... He was essentially like a physician soldier within the SS. Mm-hmm. And he was briefly a member of a frontline combat unit. And not a whole lot is known about his time there, but he served as a physician in their frontline combat unit as well. While serving in Germany and Poland, one of his duties was examining these groups of settlers, like giving them a physical exam, determining their lineage via physical exam. 
and therefore their appropriateness to settle in a given area. Almost, again, a different version of other certificates. Exactly. Like, say, okay, you, I've diagnosed you with having Jewish ancestry, therefore you cannot settle here. You have to go to the ghetto. Oh. Yeah. This How is our other side that I never knew. I'm telling you, this is like sort of a, like, yeah, it's like, a, it's like another planet. It's, I can't even like wrap my head around any of this. It's just so upsetting. So around this time, Auschwitz is built oh. and that quickly became that sort of, I know it makes, it gives me a shudder. Now that camp I've had some family members that have gone there and they said, it's like, just a place that you never forget i i actually was talking about this with my husband it's funny you said that because did he's he very he's never trip? he did not go but he's always wanted to go there because he's he's a huge huge history buff mm -hmm. and he's always been fascinated with the holocaust right. and he's like i've always always wanted to go for some reason i thought he i thought he went i know he went on a trip he said some that's, some that's kids from his class i guess went okay. on that on that trip and he said i mean you go there and it's like everyone's just completely silent yeah. I, what do you say you yes. walk through there just the the energy there must just be so heavy and mm -hmm. I, I, I just i would have I no words i remember seeing photos so i have a family member who used to be stationed in germany when they were in the military right. yeah um so they were stationed there and had some visitors and they toured auschwitz and it's from what i can remember them describing it's like no place that you will ever forget it's yeah. not a place that you go and you're just being all flashy and fooling around right it's, it's very somber and solemn. Very somber. Auschwitz quickly became a symbol of the Holocaust. Holocaust. You hear right. that word, you know, and it kind of sends a shudder, like we were saying. Hence why we just went on an immediate tangent. Exactly. Yeah. Now, this was the biggest of the death camps, and it was comprised of three main camps. There was Auschwitz I, Auschwitz II, also known as Birkenau, and Auschwitz III, which is also, also known as Monowitz. Now, once operational, Mengele quickly requested a transfer to Auschwitz. And in April 1943, he was appointed chief physician at Birkenau, that second camp. Number, okay. Yeah. Okay. So he was said to have, quote, thrived and come into his own at the death camps. He probably felt empowerment. He really, he did. And his initial duties including included assessing new inmates for medical conditions, certifying the quality of meals provided, admitting and discharging inmates from the camp infirmaries, doing autopsies for unclear causes of death. Admitting, say that again, admitting and discharging what? Inmates from the camp infirmaries. Like if there was like someone who was ill, there was like a little infirmary there. Okay. Those were sort of some of his initial uh, duties. And it was said that at one point there was an outbreak of typhoid fever among the inmates and I'm Mengele sure. brutally ended that outbreak. Um, he... Hmm took all of the symptomatic patients and he ordered them exterminated. Well, this, yeah. oh. this was a... Here I am thinking, oh, good job, dude. No, 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 no. This this is how he uh, ended that. Um, and Kill instead of treating the people, he killed like oh. a huge shitload of people all at once. And um, he replaced all the straw mats that they slept on and he cleaned it's out their rooms. Instead of being a physician and saying, I'm going to no, treat you. Yeah. And no other cases were reported after that. Now, he was awarded a war merit for this, for stamping out an outbreak. And he did this a few times. So he, so they praised him for doing this. Like, good job. You ended an, an outbreak. Sick people. Except you murdered all of those Here's people. Here's your medal. Yeah. So in addition to his camp duties, he and the other physicians conducted experiments on the prisons, prisoners routinely. And this was done on their own at first, unbeknownst to the Nazi party. So these included things like makeshift medication and drug trials, obviously completely unregulated. They would cause hypothermia, like literally fuck around with people, put them in like tubs full of ice water and then rewarm them just to like assess their response and oh see what gosh. would happen. And, see who can handle it. Yeah, I mean, and, and what they said was that they did this for the purposes of, like, rescue measures, like, figuring out, like, if they recovered a soldier from the water, you know, what was a good method to rewarm them and preserve mm -hmm. their brain function? Mm -hmm. You know, that's what they, that's what was said to be oh the reason gosh. for that. Now, there was extensive, there was an extensive series of experiments here regarding perfecting a reliable method of mass sterilization. 
Now, again, remember, he he was really focused on, like, sterilizing mm -hmm. certain people, forcibly sterilizing people. Oh, God. What is and he, what their goal, well, their goal was to use a non-surgical method because that would be the most, you know, time efficient method, right. I guess. And one top contending method was the utilization of X-ray technology to, pro to provide a high dose of radiation. Right. So using this, he could sterilize up to a thousand women per day. And to perfect this method, he irradiated thousands of men and women per day, attempting to dial down that radiation dose and figure out what that radiation dose was. What? Yep. He did that. Now... Routinely, once a camp physician was done with a subject, they would just be executed. Wouldn't that sterilize them anyway? Yeah. But, so uh, but they're not actively them. trying to... They're mostly just doing research here. They're trying to figure out... You know, they're not doing this for the purposes of sterilizing. All they're, In their mind, all these people are going to die anyway. So they're not trying to actively sterilize them. They're trying to research the best, me best method so they can sterilize everybody else in the world. Oh my gosh. Yep. So let's basically, they're their lab rats. Yeah, exa that's exactly what that was. So once they were done with the subject, they would either be executed or they were ordered, killed, or killed by the physician themselves. Or the physician would perform an autopsy with them still alive. Oh, what? Yeah. What? Mm -hmm. Like dissect them to death. <gasps> and often, this is rough. They would remove certain organs and sew people back up just to see what ha what would happen. Often getting them up off the table if they survived the procedure and saying, okay, get back to work. No anesthesia, no pain medication. Mm -hmm. Devin is shook. She is shook. I was shook reading this. I can't. The next part is really rough and I'm like bracing myself. Like, I don't even know if I can get through it. It's so upsetting. It's so upsetting. Wait. The next part? Yeah. Oh, there's a lot more, Devin. There's, like, so much more. Yes. Why was he doing... For research. He wanted to see what would happen when we took certain organs out. Devin, no other, no other physician in the world had access to disposable human beings that were alive before him. So and this was like, he found oh my this. God, this is amazing. He I saw this these, to be. I have all these clinical trial people exactly. that are involuntary. And he I can said do what I want. this. This is amazing. I have all of these living human beings at my disposal. I can do whatever the fuck I want with them. So I'm gonna cut and them I'm going to be seen dead. as a hero. And I'm going to figure out. I'm going to figure out all of these medical mysteries that we don't know anything about yet. And it's fine because none of these people are pure. Exactly. So I can do what I want to them. Exactly. So you just hold on to your buckle in, girlfriend. Oh. So this is rough, you guys. Um, once, 20 Jewish children were selected by Mengele to be sent for tuberculosis research, quote-unquote. They were purposefully infected with the disease, according to historical accounts by some survivors. Once the research was completed, they were hanged from heating pipes to eliminate the evidence of the experiments. Kids? Children. 20 Jewish children. Oh, my God. Any outbreak of any disease was treated with immediate extermination. There was an outbreak among children at one point with um, oh. necrotic stomatitis, which is like that crusty, like back, ne black, like sort of like necrosis that can occur around the mouth. It's treatable. It's a, typically a bacterial infection. And there was an outbreak among children at the camp. And these children were isolated from the rest and then exterminated. Hundreds of children. I'm telling you, this is oh upsetting. My God. You ready for more? No. I know. Oh my god. It's really heavy and it's really hard to wrap your head around. I know. You... I get it. Yeah. Sorry. It's so upsetting. Because again, this is the nature of our podcast is I really have no idea. Yeah. Oh, I think next time give me a heads up. Okay. No, no. Okay. <laughs> so oh, there were I'm also angry. I know. Okay. Don't be angry. Go All right, ahead. calm down. We got more. We're gonna get through this. Uh, okay. So there were experiments also using electroconvulsive therapy. These were conducted on inmates as well. Now, this is actually a well-known treatment, which is still utilized today ECT. for the treatment of... Exactly, ECT. Mental health, depression. Exactly. Yeah. Psychiatric disorders. And it's actually been shown to work. And nobody really knows why it works, but it does work in some situations. Sometimes. Now, many here, a lot of people not suffering from any of these diseases were subjected to ECT without their consent at very high doses for prolonged periods. Essentially, again, to just see what happens. torture, getting electrocuted 
literal torture. Yeah. To just see what happens. To see what happens. Now, there have been Holocaust survivors who recall Mengele personally and speak to his chilling and unabashed disregard for human life and the fear that his presence incited among the prisoners. And it became known in the camps that if somebody was being summoned to be seen by Dr. Mengele, that they knew that they may not return at all or be subjected oh to experiments. Dr. Death. Right? Doc- literal I mean. Dr. Death. Yes. And he was described as seeing certain humans as a problem and certain races as no more than insects that must be exterminated so as to not contaminate the stark and beautiful German Aryan race. So, he now began involving himself in the selection process. Now, oh, great. the selection process is when prisoners initially arrive at the camp to scout for subjects, essentially. Mm-hmm. It's a pretty chilling process. Essentially, a prisoner is unloaded from the cart or wherever they arrive from. And, you know, somebody sort of looks at them and screens them and says and points in one direction if you're going to the labor camp Mm -hmm. and in the other direction if you're going to the gas chamber. Mm. So it's very chilling. Now, most physicians didn't want to be a part of this. So they saw it as sort of like playing God. But for whatever reason, Mengele loved it. And he had just a striking, (sighs) genuine emotional detachment from from all of this and it's just surprised. very very scary stuff now at this point he the nazi party probably just looked at them and been like yeah. who do i want to play with today yeah now at this point they had enough uh information to sort of present to the nazi party all of this stuff that they were finding out and officially a grant was provided from the german research foundation for him to continue his efforts and he formed a research institute at auschwitz Staffed by physicians as well as some inmates doing clerical work. And some camp and prison physicians and healthcare workers were often forced to assist. Now, he had involved himself in this selection process, that chilling, you know, selection process. And they had gotten this grant. Now, it was at Auschwitz that Mengele developed a deep interest in twins. So once again, he's into the twin research and the science behind the development of twins and other multiples. And a lot of why he wanted to be at the selection process was to pick out those sets of twins and keep them. And keep them. Mm-hmm. And many sets would come through the concentration camps. And the fascination came with the thought that if I can harness the mechanism behind the formulation of twins, could we use it to multiply the members of the Aryan race and to grow at a more sufficient like a more efficient rate use the genetics of a twin to literally increase the german birth rate to to grow more people that i like yeah to to increase the german birth rate that's what he wanted to figure out how to do but in the way that the birth rate of those that he approved of yeah not just any old right of the german master race (sighs) yep so he would study twins and he would record the differences, you know, however minute, you know, oh, this one does have like a slightly different eye color or whatnot. And he would, you know, record all of that very mm-hmm. diligently. Now, adult and child sets of twins were subjected to various experiments and to data collection. And Mengele often directed the removal of certain organs for histological examination, which mostly resulted in death. If one twin died of a disease, he would kill the other to have an accurate comparative post-mortem exam. Oh, come on. And he personally was said to have killed 14 sets of twins by... In- <sighs> this is... I'm sorry. By injecting chloroform into their hearts. And once he suspected a set of twins of having tuberculosis, so he ordered them killed and dissected them himself, and he was wrong. Oh. And um, this is, I have a thing about eyes, so this is rough for me. Anybody with things about eyes, sharp things and eyes. Um, Many eye studies were conducted and there was a fascination with blue eyes, you know, as Mm -hmm. as being part of the Aryan race, the master race. Now, blue eyes were associated with like the superior race and eyes were routinely harvested from inmates for chemical testing. And that would often render people blind or at times lead to complications, which would include death, infection. I was going to say, if they're blind, can't work, whatever, there you go. Exactly. And he was witnessed injecting the eyes of Jewish children 
and adults with chemicals and medications like adrenaline and chloroform in an effort to change their eye color to blue. Oh, come. I'm telling you, this is, so it just gets you worse and, I, and worse. If we were there. Oh, yeah. We would, we are not the master race, <sighs> you and I. We have beautiful shit brown eyes, me and Devin. <sighs> The subjects he retained were often better fed and better cared for than the laboring inmates. Like the twins that he kept around for several weeks would get like better food and, and you know, get taken care like of, better sleeping quarters. Weeks. Yeah. Several and then weeks. eventually That's they it. would get killed. That's of it. course. You get a few weeks. Mm-hmm. So he also was said to have sought out pregnant women that would arrive at the camps and would, of course, do terrible, terrible things no. to them as well. Yes. So, trigger warning here. Oh, um, I'm triggered. Yeah, I know. Me too. Um, and he would perform experiments, including, like, removing the babies from the moms, removing the fetuses without anesthesia, extracting the fetuses, and then sending the mom to the gas chamber if she survived. And, again, he would routinely just, like, remove random organs from people just to see what happens and then order them right back to work. No pain medicine, no anesthesia whatsoever. Um. This is another rough one. Can I keep going? Because this is this is a lot. Mm-hmm. This is a lot. Um, he was witnessed sewing two Romani children, t- child twins together back to back in an effort to create a set of conjoined twins. And they what? a few days later, the few days, days later, they died of gangrene after many days of suffering. Oh. <sighs> this is really rough. Um, now this continued for about four years, literal daily, oh, utter torture on. and murder of thousands of people. And it was, and he that's was witnessed. That's outside of the, that's outside of the hundreds of thousands that just, that are just to like the being gas chambers, gassed. Here you go die. Yeah. Or those mm-hmm. that died of other yes. complications or natural things that happened in the, yeah, the this labor is camp. completely separate. These yeah. are just the thousands that died from him after he toyed with them. Yeah. Yep. So it was said that he was witnessed being kind to children and then it was like a a switch flipped and like he would like bring some sugar cubes for some kids and like socialize with them and it was like, okay, kill him. And then he would order them executed and they would just like be murdered right in front of him and he would just show no, like he was just absolutely a monster, a fucking monster. Yeah. Like, okay, so... Did he just go home to his wife and son at the end of the day? I mean, I guess. And oh my god! Yeah. So, um, his own son, which by the way, he couldn't get a certificate for because we couldn't confirm his racial purity. So, yeah. What did he do with his son? Here well, you go. Yeah. So <sighs> now. Around this time, the collapse of the Third Reich occurred. Yeah. And he and other high-ranking officials became marked men immediately. Uh And in January 1945, the the Red Army liberated the camps. And he was transferred to Gross Rossen concentration camp, uh, which was a neighboring camp. And much of his camp medical records were destroyed by the SS when the camp was liberated. And he did take with him a few boxes of his research and documents and some specimens. Um, but the Red Army then closed in on him there at Gross Rossen. And so he and his unit fled from there, too. And this was in February of 1945. His unit then headed west to avoid capture. However, in June of 1945, he and his unit were taken prisoners of war. Good. But Ugh. he was soon released for a couple Why? different reasons. So, number one, when he was initiated into the SS, most people from the SS will get a tattoo, which is like the the SS tattoo when you enlist in the SS, uh-huh. and he refused to get the tattoo at the time. I don't know why he refused, but that aided in his release. So, so when he said, "No, no, no, look, I, you know, I don't even have a tattoo. I'm not part of the SS." Oh. And the situation was so fluid and things were happening so fast, it was so disorganized that they were like, like, "Okay, January, they couldn't okay. prove that he was who he was." So, He and his unit were actually released at that point, Um, and they couldn't confirm his identity. So he then obtained papers under an assumed name of Fritz Holman, and he evaded capture for years. And he started working in uh, in and around Germany as a farmhand. He did this for years. Um, And in July 1940—I'm sorry, 1949, he fled to Argentina— 
And at that point, his wife abandoned him and they divorced, divorced formally in 1954. Oh, okay. So the wife and child were with him as they he were. was fleeing from yeah. all this they stuff? They saw and... each other in secret, Okay, I guess. They were seeing each other in secret and then eventually they, um, they parted ways in 1954. So he did find work as a carpenter in Buenos Aires, uh, Argentina. Now, um, he initially lived in a boarding house, which was run by a Nazi sympathizer, and it housed many Nazi war criminals during its time. And soon after, he traveled to other countries. You know, he um, he would stay with, you know, other Nazi sympathizers. There was actually a lot at this time because the Nazi party was sort of collapsing. That whole Third Reich was collapsing, mm-hmm. but people still had these ideals, mm-hmm. you know. So there was a lot. There was a lot of options for him, unfortunately. Um, he actually assumed some sales work for his father's old farm equipment company, weirdly mm-hmm. enough, which was nice for him because he got to travel all over. So he was never in the same place twice. I'm getting a runny nose from being down here. <laughs> it's so cold. <laughs> My basement is so cold. It's four degrees outside right now. Oh, yeah, <laughs> it's it is. Gross. It's, just, it's probably it's five. It's really bad. Here. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it might be five in here. It could be 12. I don't know what it is. You had frozen <clears throat> pipes before we started. I did, this. yes. <laughs> This is how dedicated we are. (laughs) The lack of plumbing and frozen pipes couldn't stop us. I know. It's really just ridiculous. (laughs) So... At this time, he while he was in Argentina and like floating around and working, he was believed to have already been dead. And because nobody could find him in Europe, he was sort of just gone. His wife had lost track of him. And so many people had died in like this disorganized effort to, you know, liberate these camps. They just assumed that he was dead. Now, um, let's see. His name was mentioned multiple times in the Nuremberg trials in the mid 1940s after the fall of the Nazi reign. But years later, he was able to obtain a passport using his real name because years after everyone thought he was dead, and, they, you know, he was like, just, oh, like, able be to be again. like, oh, well, I can be me again. And um, now this was kind of a stupid move, though, because in 1959, um, a public records r- search identified his passport as well as his divorce papers from 1954. So that, like, set off alarms that, oh, holy shit, this guy really is still alive. Um, and they put it all together. Now, so he did remarry in 1958. Get this. His ex-sister-in-law. Stop. his brother's ex-wife he married Stop. her i know isn't that gross it's just kind of gross his israeli intelligence agency named Mossad hoped to capture mengele so that he could be brought to trial in israel but their investigation failed to generate any leads and west germany also then issued a reward for his capture there were just like multiple entities from multiple countries all looking for him once they figured out that he was still alive a multinational manhunt manhunt literally ensued yes exactly now in 1960 a nazi sympathizer assisted him in relocating once more this time to brazil um west german authorities were tipped off at some point oh it is yeah i know Mm -mm. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. now west german authorities were tipped off at some point to his presence there and did attempt to extradite him but were not able to locate him and he evaded capture for years due to this like network of nazi sympathizers that aided and abetted him um and he just was able to travel all over brazil and argentina um in the late 60s to 70s, he lived in a farmhouse with friends of his. Um, however, their friendship kind of deteriorated because this guy's a fucking monster. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's when he moved out and he rented a bungalow and, and under an assumed name. He finally smartened up and was like, oh, I better not use my real name anymore. Um, you think? And he hid out in his bungalow for a few more years. Now, his health in 1972 begins to deteriorate a little bit. Um and in 1976, he actually suffered a stroke. And then in February, on um, February 7th of 1979, Mengele suffered another stroke while swimming in a swimming pool and subsequently drowned. I was just going to ask you if he drowned. He did drown. Cool. So he was buried under the assumed name of Wolfgang Gerhard. Now, um, at this point, he had never been found by the authorities, right? So meanwhile, sightings of Mengele is not justified for him. He needed worse. Oh, well, I was going to say, I I don't want to disappoint you, but like he did not die in like a, I mean, he was fucking swimming, enjoying himself. Executed. executed. Tortured first, though. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Thousand percent. Mm -hmm. So 
Now, sightings of Mengele are being reported all over, and West German intelligence received information that this Gerhardt guy who drowned in a swimming pool in 1979 might have been Mengele. And they raided the house that belonged to a lifelong friend of his. Um, this guy's name was Hans Sel- Sed- Sedlmeier. Sorry about that. Sedlmeier, I think. Um And they found a couple of things, including an address book written in code with Mengele's like multiple identities and addresses over the years. It was all like in code. It was all Mm -hmm. like very sketch. Um, And they interrogated this guy and the guy finally broke down and he said, yes, this was Mengele and I will show you where he's buried. And they did um, show him where he was buried. The body was exhumed in June of 1985. There's no rest in peace for him. No. And extensive forensic examination confirmed that this was indeed the body of Josef Mengele. Now, this was further confirmed with DNA once that was available in 1992. And unfortunately, the monster never faced any legal recourse for any of his actions. Because he's a coward. He is wildly, widely regarded as one of the most vicious war criminals of all time. Yeah. With good reason. And um, couldn't get bring get, do due diligence. No, and bring him to justice. Yeah, exactly. Now, after the fall of the Nazi Party, war criminals were tried for all of their crimes and for the murder of, and 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 many of them would say things like, "Oh, I was just following orders." You know, you've seen like videos and heard mm-hmm. accounts mm-hmm. of that. And mm-hmm. I mean, sure you were, but like you fucking murdered people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like you're and Mengele was making the orders, and he was making like, the orders was, and doing mm-hmm. it himself and doing things that were like worse sometimes in my opinion oh for sure now um (sighs) ironically his skull to this day resides at a university in buenos aires of a university of anthropology they study that. so people are studying his jaw and his skull so (sighs) that is the really Insane suggestion, Brad. And, and upsetting story of Josef Mengele, the psychotic Nazi German um, physician who oh tortured goodness. and murdered millions of people. And it's very upsetting. And now we're all very bummed Toyed out. And um, I, I did um, read an incredible book about this guy. Um, the book was called Mengele Unmasking the angel of death and it was written by david g marwell and that's where i got a lot of my information and he actually interviewed a lot of the holocaust survivors and the families of the survivors and he tells lots of like crazy and really specific stories and things that they sort of witnessed firsthand from mengele so i will link that in the show notes yeah exactly there's not many of him left so this is many of them left so this no, is you know there can't be many of them all left, really but... important story to tell and the this ones was... that are left were young young children so I know. could you imagine yes having those stories with you for your entire i can't life? i can't imagine i mean that is just incredible <sighs> thanks kate so <laughs> sorry Here to upset again. you i know the end of another podcast where i feel like oh like man. a damn dude good good story i know it was it was a really really um crazy story but um if you guys uh want to send us a like on instagram you can find us at med crimes podcast you can send us a twitter at med crimes pc you can facebook us by searching med crimes podcast or if you wish to become a patreon www.patreon.com slash 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 bitch med crimes podcast <laughs> sorry we're really cold in my basement sorry tongue's frozen <laughs> <laughs> it's really bad my nose is running i'm like literally trembling <laughs> this is what we do for love thank you for listening guys yes thank you for listening bye, bye.